I'm Drew Stevenson, and this is a lecture for my Law and Economics seminar about criminal law. And here we're going to be talking about transaction costs and uh, criminal law. So transaction costs are a subfield of economics that looks at the time and effort and other expenses involved in doing a certain activity. And so I'll give a very familiar example for you. A lot of us are used to shopping online now, right? So from the convenience of your own home, um, or maybe even just using your phone, you can uh, go on Amazon or to other shopping sites and buy the stuff you need and have it show up at your doorstep. And that takes a lot less time and effort than um, uh, the way we did when I was a kid, where you would go to the mall and spend an entire day Saturday going from, from the store to store, uh, looking for the items you wanted at the best price and so forth. So um, we've really lowered the transaction costs of shopping uh, for at least certain types of items, right? Because you can just look at and compare different uh, the prices from different sellers and so forth from your phone or computer at home uh, without going from store to store. Uh, some of you have, if you've flown before and gone through airports, you know uh, how expensive even getting a hamburger in the airport terminal can be. And um, and part of that is that it's not just that the rents are high uh, for the franchises, the the Burger King that's in the air, airport terminal or the McDonald's, it's that they also know that that you're not going to leave the terminal, go out through security, get in a car or get on a bus and go find another Burger King or McDonald's so that you can get that burger for a more reasonable price. You're going to, the transaction costs are just too high. And so in that sense, the the elevated prices that you pay in the airport terminal or somewhere like that actually kind of reflect the transaction costs or build it into the price of the product. Now, this idea of transaction costs, which affects us every day, right? When we think about how, how far we have to commute to a job or school, how many steps are involved, how many passwords you have to memorize to log into different learning management, course management systems uh, for your law school courses and things like that. Um, we're familiar with this and this can help us with analyzing uh, some areas of law and policy. So let's apply transaction cost analysis to criminal law for a moment. So first of all, we, when we want to, let's say we want to deter crimes, well, one approach, and there's no approach that's perfect, but is to raise the transaction costs of the crime. And so this is the reason that people bother having multiple locks on their doors or um, when you're in a hotel room of not only closing the door, but also uh, locking the deadbolt, um, having walls or fences around your property or having uh, your property set back from the road. So there's just more time or distance to um, make a getaway if somebody burglarizes your house and so forth. I um, uh, uh, Some years ago, there was a rash of car burglaries at the uh, fitness center that I would go to, the local YMCA, and um, almost all of them actually were uh, uh, break-ins of cars that were close to the street. So if you parked way in the back of the parking lot, far from the street, you are less likely to get your car broken into. And that's because people don't want to be kind of stuck in the back of the property and have all this distance. They want to lower the transaction costs. And so if you have things like your parking lot um, uh, or uh, the items you want to secure are in a safe that's inside another safe and so on, um, that raises the transaction cost of committing the crime. And at the margins, that reduces the, the incidence of crime. It makes some people decide it's not worth it or people attempt and then give up um, halfway through and so forth. Um, another way to raise the transaction cost of crime is to figure out what the essential tools are, like weapons or um, the tools for picking safes, uh, picking locks, or um, the flat sticks that they use to open car doors. And basically require more steps, raise the price or require more steps in the process of acquiring them. So background checks for weapons or um, waiting periods or making it very difficult uh, to, to buy certain tools unless you can um, buy them, acquire them on the black market, which involves a lot of searching and so forth. So we can also um, make it more difficult or 
uh, raise the transaction costs for fencing stolen goods, make it difficult for people to uh, to sell things um, after they're stolen or to launder money. So, for example, there's a uh, federal law that um, financial transactions like wire transfers have to be reported if they involve more than a certain amount of money. So, uh, of course, to work around this, people that want to launder money will break their transactions into smaller amounts. Well, that's not a, a perfect workaround because that raises the transaction costs of the, the criminal activity. Now they have to keep track of a lot more smaller transactions. It's a hassle. They may still do it, but you, you have to recognize that if you are forcing people to break their transactions into smaller and smaller increments, that you have, at least to some extent, raised the transaction costs. Maybe not enough to deter them from committing the crime, but maybe at the margins, it could make a difference or make it easier to detect and catch people. Um on the other hand, there are transaction costs for the criminal justice system. So um, passing laws, punishing people, all of that requires uh, time, effort, and equipment. Um, police, right, and detectives and the FBI, uh, all these people that detect that a crime has occurred, determine, figure out who the perpetrator was, hunt that person down, find, apprehend, and detain criminals, um, the prosecutors and DAs and U.S. attorneys who uh, prove um, guilt or uh, convict at trial or get a plea agreement uh, during uh, plea negotiations, um, all of that costs money, right? Those people get salaries and pensions and benefits and, um, and maybe have a, a squad car. The police have a, a, a government car that's provided for them and so forth. And so there's a lot of overhead costs involved with prosecuting and deterring crimes, um, even at the stage of finding the criminals, right? Um, and of course, in, our prison system is expensive. There's incarceration costs and the costs of appeals and so forth. So now let's talk about uh, the trial itself. If you're a prosecutor, um, it's easy, of course, if the person has confessed to the crime and they got their Miranda rights read to them and they still gave a full confession, um, a recorded confession or something like that. Otherwise, if they haven't confessed, the hardest part of your job all, it, it, as, on a, as a general matter is proving their intent, right? It's much harder to show, prove beyond a reasonable doubt what was going on inside someone's head than what they actually did on the outside world, right? The, the injury or the money they stole or the drugs that they were possessing or something like that. And so it's easier to prove actions and items and harm than what the person's intent was. And so this means for a prosecutor, there's an incentive to um, to kind of lean towards charging for crimes that don't require specific intent, like malice aforethought or um, the intent to commit a felony therein or, or uh, some of these other crimes that you learned about in your first law, uh, first year criminal law course that were specific intent crimes where there, you really had to show that the person intended a particular harm or intended to do something. And so uh, some of our like possession crimes, like drug possession or uh, um, illegal gun uh, possession um, have a very loose um, a general intent, right? So if the person knows they have drugs, um, uh, illegal drugs, that's enough, right? We don't have to show, we don't care uh, showing what was going on in their head about why they did it or what they were hoping would happen or um, how long they deliberated about it and was it premeditated and so forth. If the person possesses something that they're not allowed to have, um, that's a, a sort of a slam dunk case. And so prosecutors, when they're deciding which charges to bring, have um, its lower transaction costs for them if they go for the charges that don't involve intent. Um, the same is true when we get to sentencing, right? So if the prosecutor can get a plea bargain, can get in, in like 95% of the cases, the person is going to admit guilt. Um, and then the real work of the case is the sentencing hearing, right? And so usually those factors, sentencing factors, are easier to prove because they don't involve showing what was going on inside the person's head. So for example, if you have a uh, if we're going to give a stiffer sentence for a repeat offender, well, we don't have to show what was going on in their head. We just have to show how many crimes they've already been convicted of. Or if the crime involves a, a greater punishment, if it was more than a certain weight of drugs or more than a certain amount of money was stolen or something like that, that's easier to prove. So sentencing factors are typically less work or have lower transaction costs for prosecutors 
than proving the mens rea of the underlying crime. So the incentive is to um, uh, to get the uh, uh, admission of guilt on some charge and then focus your efforts on the sentencing factors. Um, <clears throat> also, remember that prosecutors uh, have some incentives uh, to avoid going to trial. Trials uh, involve intense transaction costs, right? Uh, so they take a lot of time and effort and resources and, um, and so forth and oppor present opportunity costs. If you're at trial, you can't be doing other things, um, catching up on your other cases and so forth. So it, you don't want to take every case to trial. You want to bring the cases that are worth taking to trial because you know you can win. And if you win, <clears throat> if you only bring cases to, to trial that you know you can win, it get, makes your threats um, to go to trial um, in future plea bargain negotiations more credible. And so what, what this means is there's a tendency for prosecutors to have an incentive if they do go to trial to go ahead and seek this the maximum penalty for the same reason as above. So that because they want to settle most cases, there's not a t enough time um, to take every case to trial. And so you want to be able to threat threaten during uh, plea bargain negotiations. If you make us go to trial, we're going to ask for a higher sentence than if you will just admit guilt right now um, and accept a guilty plea. And also remember that prosecutors could have career ambitions that are dependent partly on their win rates. Nobody wants to be known in the office as the person who loses all their cases. Um, and so this can affect, uh, play into what they perceive to be the transaction costs uh, of going to trial. Um, defense counsel has uh, their own set of uh, kind of quirky incentives. If you're court appointed counsel, and most defense uh, counsel is in our criminal justice system, then in a lot of states, there's a fee cap, right? So um, you're going to get paid a modest amount per hour, and then it caps out. If there's a fee cap, then you have an extra incentive to end the matter quickly with a plea rather than prolong it with a trial. The longer you spend on the case, the less you're making per hour in, in that sense. Um, remember that the prosecutor doesn't really want to take risks at trial. So if they have a case with weak evidence, that's your weak evidence is your main leverage as defense counsel. Um, and also keep in mind that in the United States, defense counsel cannot charge contingent fees in criminal cases, criminal defense cases, based on the outcome. They either have to charge an hourly rate or a flat fee. And so think about how that affects their perception of um, the benefits of going to trial. And that concludes our lecture about transaction costs and criminal law.